It is Acts 2, 14 to 37. <clears throat> then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? So be it. because I am tired. Did all that moving while Sherry kept all the youngins and she still looks chipper than I do. Yeah. And try to figure out the air last night, but we can thank Logan for having air conditioning. I never looked for duct tape coming off of a switch. <laughs> and if anybody knows where uh, the panel number four is for the fuse boxes, you can let both of us know. Because we found one, two, three, and five. So wouldn't you think there's a four somewhere? Yeah. But anyway, we'll get started. I mine, so. Oh, did you to see if he knew? He has not yeah, that's uh, unless you know we just somebody didn't know how to count and they one, two, three, five. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, who knows? <laughs> but this air conditioning feels nice. So let's thank God for the able to be able to worship him freely here and, and cool. <laughs> Father, we do thank you and praise you that you are a mighty, awesome God, well deserving of all of our praise and so much more, that you are faithful and true, your, your covenants endure forever. We just thank you for the promise that you fulfilled with Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord, our friend. Lord, we thank you for his finished work on the cross. And Lord, we thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit that you yourself would come to dwell with us, to teach us all the things that Jesus told us so that we can be the kind of children that you have created us to be. Lord, we long for the day that Jesus Christ will return and that we can be a part of the kingdom of God for all eternity. Lord, help us to not take lightly this position that we have to declare your name to the world, to live as a righteous, holy people, a priesthood telling others of Jesus. And Lord, may we write your words upon our hearts and upon the doorposts of our homes so that our children will follow after us as well in our faith. Bless these readings of your word today, Lord, and just to prepare us to be the light that you have called us to be. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm kind of preaching about Acts 2, but I probably won't get into Acts 2 again yet. If you were here last week, I kind of bounced some off of Troy, where Troy went back to Genesis to see the needs and desires we have and what it was like in the relationship with God in the garden. And we looked at some of the things there and saw how God is an awesome, loving, creator God that created us not because He needs us, but because He desires to have a relationship with us. And that even though that we've sinned, God is still faithful he loves us and He will provide a way for us to be made right, which of course is Jesus Christ. And as we build up to this point, we've looked at God as a Father. We've, we've looked at Jesus. We've looked into Pentecost and the different things. We looked at the Holy Spirit as a person so that you could relate to the, to the person of God living in you as the, the person of God as a Father, whether you had a good Father or not. And then we get up to that day of Pentecost. And Jesus told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And if you look all throughout the Old Testament, which Peter would have been preaching on the Old Testament, and in the things that he heard Jesus say, because the other books of the New Testament haven't been written yet at this point, and he would be talking about the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit and how God's people would prophesy in these latter days. Peter quotes from Joel and he quotes um, 
from, da- from David in his sermon. And the people are cut to their, ha- to their heart, and 3,000 are added to the church that day, the birth of the church. So I want to start in John 14 first and remind you of some words of Jesus. When Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit... He tells about it from Scripture that God the Father promises to pour out His Spirit upon the people. And in John 14, starting in verse 15, He says, If you love Me, keep My commands. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate, another comforter, another helper, to help you and be with you forever. Kind of like a legal counsel or aid one that will not only give you the advice you need, but will empower you to be able to do those things. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you and He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Now here we are at Pentecost, and there's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit coming to a believer as being born again, but the outpouring of the Spirit which... Joel prophesied about, that men and women would prophesy about uh, God's love for, for mankind through Jesus Christ. The uh, sound, and again I apologize, I'm having to think, the sound that they heard in everything was like a mighty roaring wind, but that wasn't what the emphasis was on. It wasn't that the emphasis was on the fact that all the different people could hear in their native tongues. The emphasis was on that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior, if you read this, this passage. That even though the Jews rejected the Messiah with all the signs given by the finger of God, all the things that Jesus did, they still rejected their Messiah, they crucified Him, And God still loved them. And it was His will and His desire for mankind to be saved. Last week I read to you some of Paul's final words to Timothy. Telling him how to live. Because you see the holy requirement for God's people in the law. You see how Israel failed. And we can look at those things as examples. But we know God's love for us because He sent His one and only Son to die for us. And Paul wrote these words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2. Paul is going to lose his life, and he tells Timothy to fight the good fight. And he says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 7, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And I asked you last week if we are doing that, if you're doing that. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved, which Peter talks about in his Pentecost sermon, and to come to knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, This has now been witnessed at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Now as we go on to read in Acts, and think about this as you're doing this, Peter is preaching primarily to the Jews. He's 
t telling them about the prophecy that they should have already seen, the, the examples that they should have seen of, of the, the mighty powers of God performed through Jesus Christ. And he still says, there's still a chance for salvation for you. The day of the Lord is coming. You can count on everything that God has said because it is all true. It, he is not a liar. He will do everything that He says that He will do. And think of the promises that Jesus gives you uh, in the fact that He will return in the comforter that you have. Now I want to skip over to 2 Peter chapter 3. I know I'm skipping a lot, but I want you to, to think of all these and encompass this first sermon that comes to the, to the Jewish people have, that have crucified their Messiah. In 2 Peter chapter 3, so this is Peter's second letter that he's written much later in, in the time frame. He says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. How you're supposed to live as a child of God. And I can't stress this enough because we see the mistakes of Israel and yet so many times we live our lives as they're our own, that they're not purchased, that we can do whatever we want to do, that we put God over here and we apply Him to our lives instead of Him being the center of our life, being everything to us. We, we continually think about loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. But do we really live that way? Are we being distracted or weighed down by the things of this world? Verse 2 of 2 Peter 3. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. That Jesus Christ, if He is your Savior... He is your Lord. He is your everything. He gave up His life for you, and He expects you to give up your life into service for Him. Now, what that looks like for each one of you is a different thing. We won't get there today. But is He Lord of your life? Verse 3, Above all, you must understand that in these last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is the coming He promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's words, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the, word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear like a roar, with a roar. The elements with, will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done it will be laid bare." Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless blameless and at peace with Him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction." Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawlessness and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory now and forever. Amen. So on the day of Pentecost, we have this sound like a tempest or a hurricane, and we have... With our eyes, we see that the Spirit comes upon them like tongues of fire. 
And the people and the, and the, and the apostles start uh, talking in foreign languages. We'll put it that way instead of tongues. That, that's okay. And the people that came to witness, because this is a big festival, they've all come together from all the different tribes, they can hear their, the, what the apostles are saying in their own native tongue. Why? So that we can be a witness to the world of God's unfailing love through Christ Jesus. We can be empowered to be the kind of people that the Israelites failed miserably at, that anyone would fail miserably at, because we are sinners saved by grace, not by our own works of righteousness, but being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I've said before, and I'm going to say it again this time, that I wonder how much we're denying the power of the Spirit today. And if you look at some of these doctrines out there, you'll see that that some say that the, these gifts of the Spirit were only for that time, but then you look and you'll see that throughout the Scriptures it talks about some of these gifts. And if you're not prophesying, if you're not reading God's Word, understanding, trying to divide this so that you can rightly handle the Word of truth, if you're not teaching it to your children, if you're not making God your center of your world because of what He's done through Christ Jesus, then do you ex really expect the gifts of the Spirit to be poured out upon you? If you're witnessing to people, if it means everything to you, then maybe, just maybe, you'll experience God living in you, living through you more than you are experiencing now. And I'm not condemning by any means. I'm not saying that you don't do that. I'm saying it as a point of self-evaluation. Am I living like this first church lived? Am I living the kind of life that the Israelites should have lived? Am I living as though the world would know that I love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength? And am I loving my neighbor as myself, even my enemies? Am I doing that? Is my church doing that? So like I said, I want to get to Acts chapter 2 and talk about the sermon, but I know I won't make it that far today, but at least we have air conditioning so I can go longer than I could have if I didn't have <laughs> air conditioning. Just saying. I want to go back to Genesis. And again, I'm setting all this up for you to think about. And I want to look at God's promise to the father of the Hebrew faith, the promise to Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. Leave the ones you love because I'm going to take you to some place different. The place that you're from, and you can read into this and study it more, but it's filled with idolatry and I don't want you to be a part of it. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Are you willing to give up everything to follow Jesus or is there something that you're not willing to give up? Are you like that young rich ruler that came to Jesus that day and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he went away sad that day. I think the sad is not, doesn't even remotely describe what he went away that day when he walked away from Jesus because he had much wealth in this world. And don't look at that as a bad thing because there are plenty of people that had plenty of wealth and gave richly because of it. The wealth is not a bad thing. But if you have it as an idol, or if it means more to you than God does, then there's a problem. And Troy talked about some of those things in our life. Verse 2, you have God's promise. If you go, you have to go first. You have to do something first. And as we look at Acts chapter 2, we'll see when they're cut to the heart, they said, what should we do? And Peter tells them what to do. Verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Because you do what I tell you to do, because of your obedience, which we read John chapter 14 first, and if you love Jesus, you will obey His commandments, and then He will send the promised Spirit to you, which, again, He's talking about the outpouring of the Spirit, because if you believe, you've already been born of the Spirit, born of, born of God, born above. But He will pour out His Spirit on you so that you can live a life that you never could have lived otherwise. 
that you really can maybe step out of the boat and walk on water, or that maybe you will speak in tongues, or maybe that you will prophesy, or maybe that you will have the gift of healing. But if Jesus isn't your Lord and Master, and you're not obeying His commands, then don't expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You might have the Holy Spirit. You might just make it through the flames and be saved. But each laborer's work will be tested. And the foundation that we build upon is Jesus Christ and no other. <clears throat> but if you go, then God makes all these promises to, to Abram and said, then says, you will be a blessing to others. Because they will, you, because you know God, you will make Him known. I think that might be a, a thing that we say here at Springs of Living Water, right? To know God and make Him known? Are we doing that? Because then you'll be a blessing to others. And the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah, and destruction did come to the nation, but God brought them back as a nation, and He's got so many more promises that He will fulfill to the uh, Jewish nation. But right now, He's using this body, the body of Christ, called the church. Are we being the kind of church that we should be? Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And here we are at Pentecost, and we see the outpouring of the Spirit which God promised. Uh, Peter quotes from Joel about that this is what's happening. They're not drunk, that they're prophesying as Joel said they would, because we're in the last days. God will do exactly what He says to do, that He's going to do, and He will even do it through an unholy people. But the church definitely should be a holy possession of His, a royal priesthood, as though God was making His proclamation of reconciliation through you and I. So you've got to consider what you believe, if you truly do believe it, if Jesus is Lord of your life, and if you're following by the Holy Spirit, if He's guiding you into all truth, teaching you everything that Jesus said and did, so you can apply it to your life. Abraham is the father of the Jewish faith, and he was tested also to prove his faith. Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up. He loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. The faith that he had in God that God would supply everything for them, that God loved him, the faith that would even bring his son back to life if that's what it took. But there's no questioning here. There's obedience here to God's commands. God is a loving God. He is the father of the Hebrew nation. And we looked at how he is the perfect heavenly father, whether you knew that person or not in your life. He will give you such good Things. He desires good for you. He created you even though you rebelled against Him and He knew that you would. He knitted you in your mother's womb. And He saved you because He gave up His only Son. You don't have to. But are you willing to give up your life in return? The author of Hebrews wrote about this faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see that we know that God's got it all taken care of. There's not any way that I can protect those four grandbabies down there. There's no way that I can bring about their salvation, anything else. Even when they're in the car with me and everything else, I have no idea if they'll be safe. I think I'm in control, and I'm not. Just like you said, seconds later, and things would be different. My mother was in a wreck this weekend, and... <sighs> She's 81 now or something. She went from Tallahassee to McBee, South Carolina to buy peaches for her friends. They sell peaches in the grocery store. But she's got to get them off the tree. And she was rear-ended on I-20. 
And then she called me distraught. I'm like, Mom, I can't help you. I can't do anything. Even if I was there, what am I going to do other than, uh, you know, walk you through this? You got AAA, call them. Talk to the officer. Do what you've got to do. Leave your car behind. Get a rental car. And don't worry about the peaches. <laughs> but the peaches are all bruised up. If I don't get them down there and get them to them quickly for them to, to cut apart and, and uh, freeze or make cobblers out of, they'll be ruined. So what? <laughs> Thank God that you weren't hurt. Thank Him for your provisions. And she said, you're right. Thank you. Every day is a blessing from God and an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. But the reason I'm saying all these things leading us up to this is you've got to realize that you've got to live a holy, set-apart life. You can't look like the world. You've got to look different. They've got to know that your faith is genuine. One of the biggest deterrents that our children have is they don't see our faith as genuine. They say, no, I don't need the faith of my father or my grandparents. Maybe the faith of my grandparents is a little more than my father's. Because we're so distracted by the things of this world, we don't look different than the world. And God has called us to be set apart, to be obedient. And He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that we could not have done before. God living through us, transforming us so that we can offer our bodies as a living sacrifice because we don't have to offer our son or anything else. Jesus Christ was offered up for us. Verse 2 of Hebrews 11, This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understood that the universe was formed at God's command. We get that. So that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. So let's start thinking spiritually. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering. He offered something to God and it cost him. He offered a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Lord, though, not just Savior, that He's Lord of your life and He is, did not orphan you, that He asked the Father to send the Holy Spirit to you to empower you. Don't miss that point. To empower you like we see in Acts 2 because if you believe, you're born again. But the reason that Jesus sent the Spirit was so that you could walk with Him each day in a better way than you could walk if Jesus was walking right here beside of you. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Then verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seeks Him. So if the power to live a holy life is from the Holy Spirit, why are you not studying, studying this Word? Why are you not praying and petitioning and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus Christ to you so that you can do what He tells you to do, that you can be obedient to His commands, even to the point of denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after Jesus, whatever it costs. Isn't it worth it to save your family? Isn't it worth it to save your friends? Isn't even it worth it to save your enemies? I love what you said earlier that, that you prayed that it doesn't matter if it's the very last second. You want them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because without it, there's eternity gone. Never to know Jesus again. And we are the conduit that the Holy Spirit uses through us to put the power out in the world. It's God's power, but it flows through us so that we can be children of the Most High. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes in must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Then we have another example. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes from Joel and David, and he says, The day of the Lord is coming, when judgment will come, when Jesus Christ, who is Lord, will reign. But right now there is a chance to repent. 
and turn to God. Turn from your evil ways and turn to God. Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. I've told you how much that verse means to me. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, give me the power to do it through your spirit because I want to save my family. I want them to know Jesus Christ. I want to make him known. <clears throat> By his faith, he condemned the world. The whole world was against this one man. <laughs> probably even his children, probably even his wife. And he became an heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Now we're back to Father Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive his inheritance, he obeyed and went. We looked at that scripture. Even though he did not know where he was going... By faith he made his home in a promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, Oop, as did his sons Isaac and Jacob. That promise that if you're faithful, God is faithful. <clears throat> Who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, his wife, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies and as countless as the sand on the seashores. Because God does exactly what he promises. But not everyone who says their father is Abraham is of the faith of Abraham, is that, are they? Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who goes to church is saved. Not everyone who professes they're a Christian knows Christ. If you know Christ, He is your Lord. He is the center of everything and you want to make Him known. And you want to live a holy life because you've been convicted of your sin. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and convict people of their sin so that they could, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live righteous lives and then be that, that herald, that ambassador to the world. So the church, as born in Acts chapter 2, is our example of what this new child of God looks like. This child that realizes God's love as a personal father because of how much he loves him that they would sacrifice his only son to save him. How are you responding out of love back to him? Does this church resemble the church in Acts chapter 2? I want to read a couple Psalms. And that's probably where I'll close. I didn't bring my watch. And then we'll get into... Um, I'm early. Oh, okay. Then I might go further. <laughs> the other people shaking their head. Okay. Psalm chapter 1. This is the, the Jewish book of Psalms that they sing and everything. They recorded in a specific way. Psalm chapter 1 reads this way or is sung this way. Blessed is the one... I don't know how it would go. <laughs> Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, pleasing God by being obedient, and who meditates on His law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers." Now, we're not going with the prosperity gospel. We know that the prospering means in the long run. Because on this earth, you will have trouble and tribulation. And if they persecuted your Savior and Lord, they will persecute you. Don't be surprised. Verse 4, Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You should meditate on that psalm all the time. That God is for you. And if He is for you, who can be against you? No one. 
that He wants good for you, that you'll be planted firm and strong, that I should meditate on His laws and delight in pleasing Him. And I know that I am a sinner and I cannot do it. So I have to pray for the Holy Spirit to empower me to do it, to be like Jesus, because I'm not like Jesus on my own. I am naked, blind, pitiful, but because I am clothed in Jesus' righteousness, because I have God's armor to put on, then I can tell the devil to flee with me, flee from me. But if I'm not taking and casting off anything that hinders me, how am I going to run that race? If I don't look different than the world because of what I'm doing, will I not fall into a snare? Do I not look like the Pharisees and the blind leading the blind into destruction? Oh, how wretched I am. But I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you'll just let the Holy Spirit be poured out through you. Now consider what God did. That He give, gave you His only begotten Son. That He did fulfill His promise of the Holy Spirit. You see the outcrying and the birth of the church in mighty numbers. And God kept adding to their, their numbers daily. Now let's look at Psalm chapter 2. Because this is the opposite of the one who is planted firmly. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? We don't look at it that way though. We just look at it as we're just all going about our own merry way and there are good people out there. But guess what? Good people die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Bad people do also. Bad people can be saved. Good people can be saved. But the only way you're going to be, be saved is to put your faith in the one who is the Messiah, the Lord and Savior, God's anointed one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Is that who he is to you? Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at, the, at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. You, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate His rule with trembling. Kiss His Son, or He will be angry and your way will lead you to destruction. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Either you're with Jesus or you're against Jesus. Either He is your King or He is not. Either He is Lord of all or He is Lord of nothing. Are you keeping anything from Him being Lord in your life? Is there anything you haven't given Him? Are you letting the Holy Spirit be poured out on you so that you can be His hands and feet in this world? You know, there's one thing about when we taught youth, Sherry and I did. They were honest. <laughs> I mean, when they would come to start asking more questions about Jesus and everything and get to His Lordship, they'd see it before I ever said it. You know, I believe all this. I believe. But I don't want to change the way I live. And I believe there's so many Christians that feel that way but don't even realize it. I mean, look at all the woes that Jesus said to the Pharisees. Look at the Israelite nation. How could Jesus come in on Monday and they sing, Hosanna, save us? And they'd be put to death on Friday. Because I don't want to change the way I live. Because I want to be my own Lord. <laughs> Which I'm not in control of anything. But I want that desire in my heart because I am sinful. And I either come to the light so that I can shine the light of Jesus through me. Or I don't. Either He's Lord of everything in your life or He's not. In John chapter 7, then I might. Jesus said these things to the Jews. 
they asked him how, where he got this teaching from. I'm in verse 16. And Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. God sent Jesus just like he sent Abraham. Jesus was obedient even to the death of the cross. He did it because he loved you. And he loved the person over there and the person over there. We were all his enemies. And if you have the mindset of Jesus, then you will love others so much that it permeates you. That you want to be obedient because you want to make him known. It, the whole process is there. We see it through the, through the law and the fact that the law couldn't say us, save us. We see it through the mistakes of the Israelite nation. And we should be seeing it through the mistakes of the church today, how we're not united in not being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We can see it from the epistles. That there, there's heresy that constantly comes in the church that Satan is trying to deceive and distract us from our mission to be ambassadors, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Because if we're not proclaiming Him and we're not living the life that we should live for Him, then people are perishing without knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So Jesus said, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? I know. I didn't kill Jesus. You didn't kill Jesus, right? Where would you have been that day, though? Would you have been swayed by the crowds? You know, there only a remnant believed. And there's probably still only a remnant in the church that believes. If it cost you everything, would you follow Jesus? Because again, as, as our church states, there's living water to be found in Jesus. And living water should flow through us. Later in that chapter, in verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival, and we talked about some of these festivals so you could understand that, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, this would have been the least thing that you would have ever expected in this ceremony. And there would have been plenty of people, oh, I can't believe Jesus is doing this, you know, getting up and speaking now. He's not being reverent. But Jesus stood up in a loud voice and said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant the Spirit. I am going to close here. I didn't think I had time to get here. Is the Spirit flowing through you? As we get into the, this sermon of Peter's, we'll look at this and we'll look at what happened. But wouldn't you like to see 3,000 added to our numbers daily? Wouldn't you like to see the powers of healing and other things happen in, in the church? And not be, oh, I'm skeptical because, you know, now we're becoming too charismatic or anything like that. If Jesus isn't your all in all, if He isn't the Lord of your life, I don't think you're going to see the outpouring of His Spirit that Jesus talked about. And I don't think it was meant just for certain few We have a heavenly Father that wants to give good gifts to His children. And what of you earthly fathers don't want to do that? But how much more will your heavenly Father pour out your, His Spirit? Not so that you can live a comfy life. Not so that you can just be healed of things. Paul never got healed of his thorn in his flesh but so that you can be a witness that you can proclaim. Even when you're sitting in jail, you can be writing epistles to the church, to the letters to the church that you wouldn't have had a chance to otherwise. That you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That you can encourage a young man like Timothy not to fall short of that goal. To look at what 
suffering that Paul is facing and count it as glory that you're suffering because Jesus Christ suffered for you. Is the Spirit flowing through you and I where rivers of living water are pouring out? I'm going to go back to the woman at the well. <laughs> she didn't have any of the knowledge, anything else. We didn't see any mighty miracles there or certain things. She simply went back and said, Could Jesus be the one? Which is more than the disciples did that day. And many people had to make that decision in their life. Is Jesus who He says He is or not? Am I going to accept what He says, what He teaches? Am I going to be obedient and I'm going to live the life that God created me to live in the first place? And He gave me the power of the Holy Spirit to live that. Or am I going to continue to try to live my own life and proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior and hope that's good? One of the most terrible verses in the Bible is when the people come to Jesus and says, we cast out demons in your name and, and performed other mighty miracles. And they said they prophesied. They talked about Scripture and everything, but they didn't know the author of it who wrote his love letter to you because he loves you so much that he doesn't want to spend one moment away from you. He wants to spend all eternity with you. What's he gain out of it? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that one. I just know that my Father loves me so much that He gave His Son to save me and He gives me the Spirit to reveal everything that Jesus taught and said so that I can live as Jesus did, proclaiming His name until I spend all eternity with Him. And I hope and pray that's how you feel as well. Father in heaven, we do thank You and praise You for your outpouring of the Spirit. That you would come and li to live with us. And Lord, help us to not just be satisfied with the Holy Spirit living with us, but for us to pray, to intercede, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. To pray for others. To think of others' needs over ourselves. To love even our enemies. To deny ourselves to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. Lord, may we be thankful for everything that you've given us in this world and count every day as a blessing and as every day an opportunity to live a life that brings glory and honor to you, to let our light shine. Father, we thank you for the, for the gift of life and for the, our families, our friends, our neighbors, for the freedoms that we have in this country, that we can worship you, that we can proclaim you, that we can come together and break bread and fellowship and read your word and study that your Spirit provides us spiritual gifts and abilities to enable the body to work and function well. May we proclaim you boldly even in the midst of persecution. And may we look at these examples that you've given us in your Scripture of the early church and may your Spirit fill us to be a church that multiplies, that thinks of others and and shows them the way, the truth, and the life. Father, we thank you that Jesus gave up heaven, gave up his life because of his love for us, and that he did not orphan us, but that he's here with us every moment of every day. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.